the global economy is weakening very quickly. Um, that's backed up by a lot of metrics. Uh, most recent data out of, out of China indicates they're on the brink of a recession, if not in a recession, which is kind of shocking considering this was an economy that grew at 10% compound rate for about 30 years. Uh, then that sort of you know 7% became the new 10%, and then 5% became the new 7%, but now they're, they're close to zero. Uh, they lie about their numbers, they're, they're not reliable, but you know, you can, t you can uh, get something out of it. There are other you know, private sources of information that uh, show the same thing. So their growth is close, close to zero. A lot of reasons for it, you know, the real estate meltdown, the COVID lockdowns, which are, you know, probably as much political as they are medical. There's no medical sense to them whatsoever. You should just, you know, let people get herd immunity. That's how Europe and the United States got past uh, the pandemic, but China has not. Uh, but but they're continuing to do that, um, you know, decoupling from the United States, demographic implosion. So China's a mess. Europe's not much better. Um, they're again right on the border of a recession right now uh according to a lot of data but they're going to take a, a deep plunge almost uh immediately as the uh i guess they've had a little bit of a mild spell in europe but the cold weather won't be far behind i actually watched the uh the jet stream uh you know often the jet stream is kind of straight with a little bit of a wave but every now and then it goes uh, meridional which which means it's really wobbly uh, that means that's how these cold Arctic blasts come down into, you know, it could be the United States, North America, or Europe. It, it looks like that's how the jet stream shaping up. So you look for a bitterly cold winter in Europe. Uh, <clears throat> their energy is depleted. You know, you hear the, the happy talk from the EU leadership and others, you know, well, Germany's reserves are uh, almost 100% full. Yeah, but the, what they don't tell you is that the reserves are only 20% of what they need. So you got 100% of 20%, which is 20%, at least where I went to school. No new supply coming in. Uh, latest information, I had always pointed to the U.S. as being behind the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline. But when I say U.S., I kind of put U.K. in the same breath because they, they work together. The latest information is that it was actually a UK operation, obviously with the blessing and the support of the United States, just gave us a little bit of plausible deniability, but not much because the UK, as I say, they, would, they wouldn't have done it without clearing it with us. Um, so, uh, but that what that does, it takes away Germany's options. You know, if Germany decided they wanted to, you know, make amends with Putin or at least talk to Putin, get the natural gas flowing in exchange for easing up on arms shipments to Ukraine, et cetera, that, that door was open. But not anymore because um, they took away Putin's leverage. Because even if Putin said, "Yeah, I'll give you more gas," he can't do it, at least in the short run, because the pipeline's blown up. So that was that was almost like the U.S. declaring war on Germany. I mean, something we've done before, a couple of times. But uh, that's that's just sinking in. But but you know, people talk about liquid natural gas was a big uh, uh, a big story oh, a few weeks ago. Well, <clears throat> that the European Union had signed a major na uh, liquid natural gas deal with Qatar, you know, which is a major producer. So I looked into it and I was like, yeah, uh, it'll come online in 2026. Uh, basically, the Qataris, who are no dopes, were getting the Europeans to fund the build out of the infrastructure in a new gas field in the northern part of Qatar, which is, you know, peninsula. Um, yeah, so 2026, well, good luck getting from here to there. That sounds like four years away. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not, they're not going to make it through four months, and that's the point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they got some floating barges to offtake LNG, but it, the capacity is not there. The LNG is not available. And by the way, what happens to, uh, I live in New England, what happens to New England natural gas prices if Biden starts shipping our natural gas to Europe? Um, nothing good, I can tell you. So, uh, so Europe is... Um, and this is uh, more than just a slowdown, more than just an economic headwind. This is you're looking at something more like a catastrophe. I mean, Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world, or has been. It might actually be the third largest right now. I saw some recent data that they might have passed Japan, but they're they have the highest ratio of net exports to GDP. You know, GDP is a number of components. The U.S. is very consumption driven. China is very investment driven. Uh, Germany is very export driven. So what do they make? You know, uh, watches, uh, cars, uh, precision machinery, uh, you know, aircraft, uh, all, all sorts of high tech things. Siemens, you know, Volkswagen. Look at the, the BASF, the big companies there. Um, they're going to. They are. They are already starting to shut down manufacturing lines. But this is going to get a lot worse. The energy is going to be rationed. People, uh, thermostats are going to be set at you know, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what the equivalent is in, in centigrade, about 15 or something, but um, they're gonna be, uh, you know, the Germans are out chopping down trees to get 
wood to stay warm this winter. Uh, there is no firewood for sale. Uh, this isn't medieval. This is Neolithic. Um, and then, you know, the poles are lined up to get, get coal depots to get some coal in the trunks of their cars or the flatbeds of their pickup trucks for the same reason. So this is a disaster. Now, over in the United States, um, our economy, you know, so we had negative growth in the first quarter and the second quarter of 2022. Two back to back quarters of declining GDP meets the kind of rule of thumb definition of a recession. Nobody wants to use the R word. They're they're all hiding behind the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the unofficial official arbiter of recessions and recoveries. We'll see what they say. Typically, the, the National Bureau of Economic Research declares a recession, the beginning of a recession after it's already over. It's like, thanks, we've been through it. Thanks for letting us know we just had a recession. They'll probably come out and say something next year. Who knows? But, um, but if it was a recession, it, it, it kind of looks like one. It was very mild, granted. Growth in the third quarter was a lot stronger, 2.6%. But when you dissect that, what you see is that um, that was almost 100% driven by net exports. When, when was the last time the United States had positive GDP driven by net exports? Probably 1959. I mean, that's we're, 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 that's typically a drag on growth, and we've we run been running trade deficits forever. Uh, but there it was. Um, that meant that people were still buying U.S. goods, but the U.S., we were not buying as much from other people. That's ind indicative of a slowdown. Consumption was weak. Private investment was weak. Inventories were weak. Those are the real drivers of the economy, and they were all weak. So, okay, net exports. That's not sustainable. So I would look for a recession, a more severe recession, to begin in the fourth quarter. That's one, you know, combined with Fed tightening, interest rate hikes, um, balance sheet reductions, et cetera. That's one whole vector, and I wouldn't put any weight on a low unemployment rate. It ignores labor force participation rate, which is awful. You know, it's down around 62% versus 70% in the year 2000. But, um, but beyond that, unemployment is a lagging indicator. Unemployment goes up after a recession begins. Employers are very reluctant to lay off employees. You got to pay severance. Um, you, it, it's expensive to recruit and hire them back and train them. So you, you, you pretty much wait until the recession has already started and you can, oh gee, all right, I got to lay some people off. So it's not a leading indicator, it's a lagging indicator. So the Fed is behind the curve. Um, and then and then beyond all that, Adam, is the, the biggest, you know, the, the real, um, you know, 500 pound gorilla in the room, if you want to call it that, is um, there's a brewing global liquidity crisis, a global financial crisis, <coughs> pardon me, that's that's different from a recession. It's uh, financial panics and recessions are two different things. They can come separately. In 1998, we had a financial panic, but there was no recession. In 1990, we had a recession, but there was no financial panic. In 2008, we had both. They, they can come together. It looks like they might be coming together again. This is revealed in uh, inverted yield curves. Um, uh, major dealers are bidding at auction for treasury bills. The Fed will give you treasury bills with a phone call. All you have to do is call the Fed and do a reverse, reverse repo with the Fed. They'll give you some treasury bills. But the banks are bidding at auction for treasury bills that yields to maturity lower than what the Fed will give you for a phone call. Why would you do that? The answer is the Fed bills um, cannot be rehypothecated. They cannot be used as collateral, but the auction bills can. So what that tells you is there's a collateral shortage. That means deleveraging balance sheets. It means financial distress. And we also see it uh, not just in the treasury yield curve, which is inverted from uh, right now, um, six months to 10 years, but also the euro dollar futures curve, which is even more troubling. It's not unprecedented, but it is rare and it's not a good sign. But the Fed continues, you know, raising rates in the, in the teeth of this really bad data. So I look for a severe recession in the U.S., um, really global, because, you, you know, your question was, how's the global outlook? It's pretty bad. Um, maybe something closer to, you know, social unrest and riots in Europe. Um, and then on top of that, possibly a global financial liquidity crisis worse than 2008.